He co-leads the International Physical Activity and Environmental Network, Network that is coordinating studies across 20 countries. He is an author of over 700 scientific publications <coughs> and is one of the world's most cited authors in the social sciences. Thompson Reuters, Clarivate Analytics ident identified him as one of the world's most creative scientific minds in 2014-2016. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine and received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. He is past pre president of the Society of Behavioral Medicine and member of the National Academy of Medicine. So please join me in welcoming Dr. James Sowers. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, well, I will, uh, I'll, I'll probably keep you busy on the camera by moving around a little bit. <laughs> and um, uh, do we have a, now, a clicker of some kind? Thinking about that, I don't, let me see what's in here. I don't see okay. that. Okay, okay. I've gone through three of them. People borrow them and then they never oh, get them back. Oh, right. Yeah, that would be, that would be I can be, common. you can do this and I can act like the clicker. How about that? Okay, <laughs> all right. I, I, we'll, we'll do that because so I'd rather, a, I'd rather so move it's almost as good as a clicker. Okay, I'd rather move around a little bit. And since we have a, an intimate group here, a highly selected uh, group of uh, star uh, staff, faculty, and students, um, we'll, we'll make this um, a little bit informal, so uh, you can ask questions or make comments at any time. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, go over some of the things that we've been doing uh, and learning uh, trying to synthesize a lot of information into, uh, into a, a few uh, takeaways. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll talk about how we design cities and how that's related to health. Hello, come in. Um, and uh, then uh, I, 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 I want to cover something at the end on uh, translating research to policy practice. Um, and this is, this is what a research in public health should be about, um, which is a field we're not good enough at it. So, um, uh, so I'd like to uh, give you some some thoughts on how to be better at uh, actually getting our research used. Um, so let's go to the next one. So uh, what I'll talk about uh, at the beginning is uh, just make sure you're familiar with ecological models, and and certainly some of you are, and some of you may not be. And then I'm just going to give you a, a very small sample of mostly our research on macro environments or how to design cities so that uh, they're healthier for the people that live in them. And then we're going to zero in a little bit and talk about how to design a smaller environments. And I'm going to give the example of streetscapes. How do we design streets that are better for people? Um, then I'll uh, just introduce kind of our my little model of multiple pathways to research translation. And um, I give you what I think is kind of good news, uh, certainly for me, is I see how this, this work on healthier environments is having an impact on research policy and practice. And then uh, I will encourage you to be bold and uh, be an uh, even uh, more vocal advocate for uh, uh, improvements in your local city. Um, and uh, unless you want to convince me that New Orleans is already optimally designed <laughs> for healthy <laughs> lifestyles, I will challenge you to convince me of that. Okay. Uh, so, next one. All right, physical activity. All right, one of the leading causes of death in the world. We don't need to go over that. Okay, let's go on. Um, so, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the, the model of activity that we like to use. As you can see, we call it the sloth model of physical activity, which describes our current um, uh, uh, world and, and lifestyles. So, uh, um, so this is kind of roughly the before uh, pictures. Um, how activity used to be part 
of every aspect of life, except sleep. Uh, we haven't changed that one. Um, but we used to be active all the time because we had to be, um, for all of these reasons. Now, we have invented devices and electronics that, at, at the minimum, make it no longer necessary to be active. Um, um, and, and in a lot of ways, we've made it less pleasant and we've made it dangerous even uh, to be active in some places. So, so we've had really fundamental um, uh, shift in our activity patterns as a species. Um, and in fact, we've always wanted that. We've never wanted to uh, do hard physical work. And now we don't have to. Uh, so we don't. And so it's like, um, we asked what we got, you know, we got what we asked for, uh, but we're not so happy because, okay, it's killing us uh, uh, and, making, and making us miserable in some ways. So go to the next one. So ecological models of health behavior, probably most of you are familiar with this. Um, but before I could start studying, environments and policies as they related to physical activity, I had to come, I had to find new models because I was not taught this model when I was in graduate school. So you're, you're, you're way ahead of us, uh, Emma, by learning more uh, complete and more, I think, useful models um, than uh, what we were taught in psychology. Um, okay, so next one. So we've kind of elaborated on this and it turns out um, for the usual psychosocial models, um, they apply pretty well across most behaviors. So if you're studying you know, self-efficacy, you can study self-efficacy of any behavior. But if you're studying environments and policies, they are very specific to behaviors. So you actually have to think about it. You know, what, what environments, what policies are related to the, my behavior of, of interest. So you can't just automatically say, oh, it's got to be attitudes and intentions. No, no, you've got to actually think about it, learn about it. So uh, I, I, I'm not going to uh, kind of go over this, but this one is, uh, this model is for the four domains of activity. So we've got different influences for active recreation, household activities, occupational, and active transport. So. Um, uh, let's go uh, one level deeper, and you can just see that this is the, the, the section for the, uh, for the active uh, recreation. So we look at things like aesthetics and pedestrian and bicycle facilities in the neighborhoods. And you can have parks and trails and community organizations and sports. And so that's the kind of, but those are different uh, influences if you're interested in active transportation. Uh, they, they, will, uh, they will not be the same. So uh, we've been applying uh, uh, this model, or these models, and, um, uh, and now after some time, um, we have a sense of, well, what makes an active living community? Um, and I can assure you, uh, uh, I had no idea what the, uh, the elements would be when we first started this research 20 years ago because nobody taught me how to think about environments. That wasn't part of my training in psychology. So now, if we think about the home environment, so or around the home, you can also think about the work environment or the school environment or wherever you, you might spend your time. Um, at, the, at the macro level, so this is more the macro level. How do you design a city uh, that's good for activity? Um, then. Well, if you, if you want to think about active transportation, then you must have destinations to, uh, that you can walk or bike to. Um, so that has to do with the community design and policies of zoning. And um, uh, OK, so that's uh, overall design. And you might think uh, also with active transportation, can, how many people can walk to school or walk to work? Uh, or bike, or take public transit, because those are all active uh, forms of transportation. But if you're, if you're also interested in recreation, people need a, a place uh, to, uh, to do recreation. And those can be public parks, they can be private facilities like 
health clubs and dance studios, that sort of thing. Um, and so those, these kind of are your destinations, but then you have to think about the transportation system uh, because you could, you could have uh, you know, all of these destinations nearby um, that you, but you still cannot walk there because they might be on the other side of the highway. Um, or uh, there may be no safe place uh, to cross a road. So we need to think about our transportation system. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm just going to talk about really physical activity um, primarily um, as a result of our urban design and transport practices and policies, but there's a bigger literature um, linking urban design to all of these issues. You know, just a wide range of some of the biggest uh, problems, biggest health problems um, uh, in, our, in our modern world. Um, and so we're, uh, so if you think about that, the way we build cities is related to all these health problems. Um, it's not a, a big jump to say we are causing these problems ourselves. Uh, but go back one, go back one, because uh, I, I, I like to make the point that we now have evidence that all of these elements um, are related to health problems and are probably causing a lot of health problems. But a health um, is not part of the decision making of any of these, right? So um, uh, urban design uh, does not have to um, uh, achieve health goals, does not even have to consider. It's up to them. In transportation, um, they, they think about uh, uh, crashes and pollution, but not how much people are sitting or how easy or difficult it would be to walk around. So, so if we're going to uh, have any impact on making healthier decisions about where parks are and how to design them and how cities are laid out, we have to partner because we, uh, they do not have to consider health. So, uh, so it's a great opportunity for partnering. So next one and next one. Okay, so now uh, uh, um, in, in this kind of work, we, uh, you know, you start to think about what are the the differences in environments. So what are uh, different dimensions on which they can, um, which they can uh, be designed? And so, okay, we're at the macro level. We're kind of looking from above. How is a city laid out? And here are two um, uh, almost kind of a little bit polar opposite uh, cities. Everybody knows the the one on the left, uh, Manhattan. All right, and you can see. It's, very, it's nicely set up for recreation because you see iconic Central Park there. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually the most walkable, uh, this is the most walkable neighborhood in the US, Manhattan. Uh, also the least obese. Um, and uh, so we think this is walkable because um, uh, there's mixed use, so it means that People live near destinations that they want to go to, whether they're stores or, or workplaces or, um, or parks or schools. Um, and there's, uh, there's a lot of density, um, obvious, for Manhattan. And that's uh, helpful, if not required, to uh, allow so many uh, destinations and amenities to be close together. And then the streets are connected. And you see the famous uh, Manhattan grid system. Um, and number one, uh, it's almost impossible to get lost in, in Manhattan, uh, especially with the numbered streets. Um, but, uh, but it also means that you have uh, many options of routes to getting, uh, for getting uh, to get one place to another. So, um, this picture on the right is uh, in some ways the polar opposite. So we have a separation of uses. So we have houses, 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 and maybe some commercial or industrial here. Um, uh, so separation of uses. We have low density, uh, single family, one story, all low density. 
and um, we have uh, disconnected streets. Okay, here you can you can get anywhere you want, walking or biking. But here, if you want to, if you live here and you want to visit your friend here, good luck. Good luck getting there. Uh, certainly by walking, you will you will be driving. So uh, as as I've uh, uh, looked at looked at these kind of places and data over the past 20 years, I've I've come to a conclusion that's stated here, that we can design cities for people, or we can design cities for cars. And I have not seen a place that's very optimal for both of them. Uh, go back one. Um, I will, since we are a small group. I will, I, I will let you guess where this is. Any guesses? Somewhere in California. Yeah. It looks like, actually it looks very much like some places right in San Diego, in my mm -hmm. town. But it's not. It's not San Diego, it's not California. Is it near Lansel, Georgia? Um, like Stone Mountain, is it Stone Mountain? Well, yeah, it could be Stone Mountain, couldn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think it's, but in Atlanta, the, the freeways would be wider. Be crazy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not Atlanta, and I will tell you, it's not even in the U.S. And uh, I put this uh, picture in here because I was so surprised of flying into this city and seeing this scene because, uh, because it shows that this is not an American problem. This is Cape Town, South Africa. Okay, and uh, um, and uh, and it looks like America, doesn't it? And it has the same effects as America, because as you get onto the freeways, you can't see it here, but they are they are crammed full of cars very much of the time. So they have a transportation system the same. They lay out their city the same they get the same outcomes um, in traffic and uh, uh, health problems. Okay, so I'll uh, show you a little data. Um, this is from our first study of built environments, and I'm sure it was the first um, study funded by NIH on this, this kind of topic. Um, so we call this a neighborhood quality of life study. This is a study of adults, and uh, we, we had to develop a, a study design that was appropriate for understanding people that lived in different uh, environments. And so you see, uh, uh, this is our design here. We recruited people that lived in low walkable and high walkable neighborhoods, and also in low socioeconomic or neighborhood income and high uh, income neighborhoods, because we wanted to be able to study uh, disparities and also not confound uh, socioeconomic status and walkability, uh, which can happen. I'm ready. Sorry. Yeah, I'm ready. I am ready. <laughs> yes. So we did this in, uh, uh, we, we've done uh, most of our studies in King County and Seattle and Washington and Baltimore and Washington, D.C. region. Uh, and we chose these uh, in part because they have uh, uh, a uh, pretty good number of walkable neighborhoods. In San Diego, we do not, so we didn't have enough variability there. And so we have about 2,000 people, and I'll just show you some results here. Um, so uh, we published this now 10 years ago, but um, just to, to summarize, we found uh, what we were expecting. People do more total physical activity if they live in a walkable neighborhood. Um, and you see that occurs whether they're uh, a low income or high income. And go back one second. And um, so the differences in the uh, walkable uh, walkability is about five minutes here and seven minutes there. And you think, well, that's pro that doesn't seem like very much. Uh, why would we, you know, want to think we could change the way we design cities? just for this little bit of physical activity. But, but in fact, this is, uh, these, 
differences apply to the whole population, not just to people volunteering for programs, and they, they apply as long as people live there. So you, you start to get a, a kind of a population effect. But let's look at the potential, potential effect on individuals, okay? So, uh, uh, so one of these was about 50 minutes per week, seven minutes a day, about 50 minutes per week, and that would be at least two miles a week difference if you walked really, really slow. Uh, that would add up to 100 miles a year, or 10,000 calories per year, which roughly speaking would equate to, let's say, failure to gain three pounds a year for as long as you live in your neighborhood. Um, and that's uh, probably double uh, or triple the average weight gain for uh, American adults. Um, and uh, so go back one. So if we, uh, if we look at, no, 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 I'm sorry, go, go ahead. And then another one. So this is the, this is the uh, overweight and obesity percentages. And you can see there that the higher percent in the low walkable neighborhoods. And when I, I looked at when was the national um, uh, overweight and obesity rates, 48%. Um, and um, it's about 25 years ago, all right? So potentially, if everybody lived in a healthy environment, uh, we could have set back the obesity uh, 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 trend 25 years. So, so we think this is pretty important. And next slide. And the other, the other thing, uh, you know, out, outside of the South, sometimes we actually talk about climate change. In the South, maybe you don't talk about it too much, especially in a, a very petroleum-oriented uh, city and, and state. But um, driving is not good for the uh, planet. Um, and so people that live in a walkable neighborhood drive really substantially less because they don't have to. If you're in a low walkable neighborhood, you can't walk to places, you are a uh, uh, captive. Uh, of your car. All right, so, and of course, sitting is not the healthiest thing either. So next one. So uh, I won't give you the details, but we, we also had grants to study uh, children and adolescents and older adults. And we found that um, uh, built environments were related to physical activity, total and uh, um, uh, transportation uh, activity in particular in all of the age groups and the design of cities was related to BMI um, in all of the age groups except adolescents so not sure what was going on there but um, but we think adolescents you know, don't, don't pay too much attention to uh, uh, whether it's safe uh, to walk or bike somewhere they just go wherever they want to go so next one so I, I just wanted to uh, show you one um, analysis from our, uh, uh, one of our international studies. Uh, this is IPAN, International Physical Activity and Environment Network. And we, we started this when people in other countries were really not doing much of this research. So we thought, well, if we can encourage people to use the same methods and measures that we're using, then we could pool our data across a much bigger variety um, of environments. Uh, and so we were able to do that, and now uh, we publish quite a bit from our adult study and are just starting to analyze our adolescent data. So next one. So this is a, a, a paper that we were really happy with because it got published in The Lancet uh, three years ago, exactly. Um, and uh, this is a study of uh, 14 cities and I think it was about 7,000 7, people. Um, and we're uh, measuring environments with geographic information systems um, and physical activity with accelerometers. So, so both of them are uh, relative, relatively objective. And here are the uh, 10 countries in this analysis. Um, and uh, so you can see, I'll just point out uh, Mexico, uh, Colombia, and Brazil, a bunch of uh, European cities, 
This is Hong Kong, Australia, and four cities in New Zealand. And uh, um, this is a, uh, a graph of the environments. We just did a walkability index to put things together. And um, you can see that there's no one uh, country that has the full range, or no one city that has the full range of environments, although uh, Hong Kong is way off the charts for walk high walkability, but some places are almost, or you know, certainly overlap with the lowest walkability uh, places. So we go from New Zealand and U.S. on the on the bottom end to Bogota and Hong Kong on the top end. So we have tremendous range to deal with. And so what did we find? We had a limited number of uh, uh, environmental variables that were comparable enough across countries. Um, but the, the main determinant was, or the biggest uh, um, association was with net residential density. Um, and uh, uh, predicted a, a lot more physical activity. Intersection density was significant if it was the only variable in the, uh, uh, in the model. Um, so that's connected streets, mixed land use, we think that's uh, essential, um, but it was not significant here and it, that was more data problems. The, there's no, um, there's no uh, systematic way of, uh, uh, of assessing land use internationally. It's all uh, very hard to make sense of. Uh, but public transit. The more transit stops nearby, the more activity. The more parks nearby, the more activity. So right here, we have, we have data that show the connection between health and city planning, transportation policy, and park and recreation. So uh, this is relevant to lots of city departments. And when we compared um, uh, activity levels for people living in the least activity friendly cities to the, the most, um, we found differences of 70 to 90 minutes per week, which is a, a huge amount of uh, physical activity. And the, a commentary estimated that 2 million deaths per year could be prevented if everybody lived in an activity friendly uh, uh, neighborhood. So, so we think this is a, a, a big international issue. Next. Um, and uh, you know, uh, this, this in, uh, uh, literature is criticized a lot because of uh, uh, it's mostly cross-sectional, um, but there are uh, quite a few now um, longitudinal studies that have been released. This is one of those, and there are more and more natural experiments of um, uh, evaluating uh, environmental changes. This, this uh, study came from Canada, uh, Ontario, and they, uh, they graded um, neighborhoods by walkability. And this golden one, or yellow, is the highest walkable uh, neighborhoods, the highest uh, quintile. And you can see all the others uh, cluster together. But if you lived in the most walkable neighborhoods, you started out at lower levels of, this is diabetes uh, incidence, and um, that uh, uh, in Canada, diabetes is going down, so I don't think that's happening here. Uh, but it's going down more um, in the walkable, uh, the most walkable neighborhood. So this is one of the few that's uh, really connecting built environment with diagnoses. So uh, let me stop there and see if there's comments or questions about this kind of macro, the design of cities. Yes, please. Is there a correlation between the age of the cities and the walkability? Yes, there is. Yes, there is a, a massive correlation between the age of cities. Every, uh, every city or neighborhood that was built before, certainly before the 1920s, is walkable because it was before cars were very common. All right? So all old cities are walkable unless they have been improved dramatically. And so we find that the more recent the, um, the construction, 
the, le the less walkable it is. So in the 40s, the, uh, 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 things were still relatively walkable, and you had streetcars. Uh, you know, in the 50s, it became less walkable because they are farther out from the center of the city. In the 70s, farther out still and more car dependent. In the 80s, 90s, 2000s, it keeps getting less walkable and less activity friendly. And the, and the same thing that's going on here, you can see in Europe. I've seen a, a lot of newer construction in Europe that's much less walkable than the old cities that they've been building for a thousand years. I've seen the same thing in Japan. Thailand, they're selling, they're selling uh, suburban single family homes. Um, uh, and, and I showed you Africa. Um, uh, building car dependent um, uh, 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 neighborhoods and that is uh, and that is a new trend so definite uh, relation to age of construction I have a method question in the international study did you say that you collected the MVPA data with accelerometers yes how did you get that many accelerometers we shared we didn't do it all at the same okay. time. The, the studies were co conducted at, you know, quite different times. So, and, and, so and we, we had a loan, we had a loan program as oh, well. Oh, okay. And, and so we loaned. Uh, so, but a lot of the countries, we helped them get internal grants so that they could, so that they could purchase accelerometers in, in some cases. But, uh, this was a long time coming. It, it, this network, we didn't have it all funded at the beginning with some mega grant, so it, uh, um, so we had to help countries one by one either get funding or use some of our NIH funding. So it was it was a it was a long term process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Quick question. Uh, two methods questions for your walkability index. What went into that? And then was walk score the, the walk score online? No, okay. no, because a lot of countries don't have okay. that. No, they don't have it, so we couldn't use that. Um, so what we use for this it, are things that we could get that we had some confidence in. So residential density, all right, that's, that's easy to get. And um, street connectivity, all right, how dense are the intersections. Um, that's pretty easy to get, and then mixed land use. And as I told you, that was not a good measure, but um, that's what we had to use for, uh, uh, for overall walkability. So what does that mean? It means that, um, and, and we did it around each person, so we looked ar around each person's residence. So it means they've got destinations, so that's the mixed use. Um, they've, they've got, uh, uh, density, so there's lots of people there uh, that could be walking around and might make things safer, and that there's connected streets. So it's not like uh, what we call the loops and lollipops in the uh, in the in the suburbs, like you can't get there from here. So in a dent, you know, with the connected streets, you you can certainly do that. Yep. Anything Maya, else? you know, maybe you can come, and I know that you and your husband do a lot of walking in Metairie. Yes. Would you say that that's a walkable environment or not? Uh, because uh, it is walkable, yes. But we, we live right next to the lake, so there is ah. a, a special place for right. walking and biking, so we are yeah. lucky. Yeah. And it was one of the reasons why we moved there. Right. But, um, but I guess the mixed-use neighborhoods is the... But at the same time, there, there's not a commercial there, is it? Okay. Yeah, so, right. So so, but you have to cross major streets, don't you? Or do you? No, not really. No? Okay. So your, your neighborhood sounds well designed yes. for recreational walking. Exactly. But not for going to, walking to shops. Exactly. Yeah. If yeah. We need to, actually, we can walk to the Trader Joe's, but, um, but, but it's kind of far. Yeah, how long would it take you? To walk to a restaurant or grocery store. Uh, it, you have to drive. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, yeah, you have to drive. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's not a mixed use neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 So you can have one. You can have a, a neighborhood that's beautifully designed for for shopping that has no parks, mm -hmm. or you can have one like yours that's wonderful for walking and biking for recreation, but you can't walk to any destinations. So a, an active <coughs> living neighborhood is designed for both. You know, we call them complete communities, which we've always built throughout history. And if you go to, to Europe or Asia and you see wonderful places that have been very successful uh, places to live for maybe a thousand years, but we decided we're throwing out our whole history and we're going to design around cars and we have the obesity and heart disease now to show for that. So, okay, now we're going to zoom in a little bit. Okay, no, come back, come back. Uh, so we're going to be the micro level, not up above, we're going to be on the street level. What's it like for a pedestrian if you were going to walk in this place? And again, um, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to show you streetscapes. We could look at details of buildings or parks, but I'm going to just show you streetscapes here. So, um, so uh, if you want to meet our transportation goals, then you will design streets like this. Who can tell us, uh, Jeanette? Do you want to summarize our, our country's transportation goals? Um, getting the most cars across the country as they can. Get goods and services delivered through the highways. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or the, the, uh, as many cars as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Our transportation goals are literally to move as many cars as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so, job done, mission accomplished, all right? So, and so if you want to do that, you want to have wide lanes, you don't want to get in their way, you don't want to distract people, with things, so you want to have a kind of an ugly, blank, empty uh, things to look at. And if you're trying to move cars, you don't want to waste money and concrete on sidewalks. So you will see no sidewalks here. So, um, so here's the here's the the rationale for an ecological multi-level model right here, because you know. Uh, you've got a, a wonderful environment, but uh, it for driving, but not for walking. So this this man is coming from his uh, family medicine practitioner who told him he needed to get out and take a walk. So he's doing that. He's doing that once, and I don't think he's going to come back and do that again. So anyway, this is a different. So you design for cars, you get that. You design for people, you get this. And put yourself in this guy's shoes. What's that like? And then put yourself in this person's shoes. What's that like? A very different experience, all right? And this is where, okay, the, the, the roads are narrower, the cars have to go slower. You not only have a sidewalk, a nice sidewalk, you've got things to, to see and along the, the way here. You've got some mixed use. Uh, for and a little more density here. And uh, these people, the designer of this place went a little bit crazy and put in street trees. They said, okay, we're going to make it not just possible to walk, but nice to walk. All right? And we find the aesthetics um, really are the best predictor of people walking and biking for, trans for, for recreation. You have to make it nice for them to come out. So, um, we designed a measure to quantify these differences. Okay, and uh, so there's been a lot, we call this micro scale, there's been a lot less study of this, um, which is a shame because micro scale features are easier to modify than changing the whole layout of your city. Um, so, uh, go to the next one. Um, so, uh, uh, the, the, there are many of these observational measures of streetscapes where you walk down the street or, or do it online and see, see what's there, kind of code the, the features, but most of them are very long. So, uh, we started with 120 items uh, with ours and then uh, 
and then boiled it down to 15 items because we wanted something that community groups could use or city planners could use, something that would be useful for practice. So uh, let's go to the next one. So this is what we this is what we did. These are the um, the items on uh, this side, and um, we were able to uh, correlate the items, the presence of these items, and active transportation, mainly walking for transportation, in uh, four age groups that that we had in our studies. And where you see a box, that means that there's a significant correlation, and the darker the color, the more, uh, the, the, the more significant uh, it is. So you can see that um, for adults, al almost everything was significant, um, and that's probably in part because we had a bigger sample uh, for adults. You see children. Uh, very, uh, very many, and then for, for seniors, quite a few, and very few for adolescents. But if you look at the grand score uh, for active transportation, where we, we took out the, uh, the uh, uh, aesthetic ones, it's significant for, for all age groups. All right? Yeah? Looks like parks isn't in for any of them. No, parks didn't show up. Yeah. And so, so that could have to do with uh, uh, maybe in the, the samples that we had, the street samples, there weren't many parks. Um, but yeah, it, it didn't show up. This is walking for transportation that we're looking for. So yeah, it didn't, it didn't show up. I put in red the, the variables with, um, uh, with significance in three of the age groups, so street lights, benches, sidewalks, a buffer. Uh, buffer means that there's something between the sidewalk and the traffic. So you don't have rear view mirrors whizzing by your ear. Uh, curb cuts, you know, which would be good if, you're, if you have a, a stroller or if you're an older adult or you have a disability. And again, the, the grand score. So, so we found, amazingly, that the 15 item measure correlated 0.85 with the 120 item measure, um, just in describing uh, the, uh, uh, the streetscape. Okay, let's go to the next one. And it was linear. No matter where you start, you could, you could improve your um, streetscape and, and, and uh, looks like you would get uh, more walking. So this is adults and older adults, children and adolescents. It's linear uh, for all of these. Next. Um, so we were really pleased. One of the, um, one of the, uh, the things that we're seeing now is uh, uh, with 20 years of research on these topics, um, we we're able to get, uh, you know, more visibility like this Lancet issue on urban design, transport, and health which is about all of the um, health problems that I, I showed at the, at the beginning. Okay, and next one. So uh, now a little bit on research translation. Um, this is something we've been working on quite a bit. This was a big emphasis uh, of our active living research. Um, and uh, I, I love this one. This, uh, this was an illustration that came out after we had a study that showed that sidewalks in one study was the single best correlate to physical activity. And I wanted to show that it's not the case that the day after that study came out, that trucks came and laid out sidewalks. That's not the way it works. Um, and uh, so you have to really work to uh, convince people, okay, we need sidewalks. And then you need to make sure that they do the sidewalks correctly, because that apparently does not always happen. So, uh, okay, now, next one. Um, so for researchers, um, uh, how do we improve research translation? Um, and uh, uh, there's four, four requests here. One is to conduct policy-relevant research. Um, uh, 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 the study the types of questions that uh, decision makers are interested in. 
and so we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Use research methods that are relevant to policy makers. Well, what would that be? We'll get to that in a second. The second, the third one is, once you do policy relevant research, do not hide your findings. And the way you hide your findings is to publish them in a journal and put the journal on the shelf. Because that is, uh, is a way that no practitioner will find your research. So uh, you have to do other things. And then speak up, engage in advocacy. You need to educate people who uh, might be in a position to use your research. Because if you're not educating people about the meaning of your research, who is? Now if you've got an assistant or you've got your own PR department, then you don't have to bother with that. If you don't have your own PR department, then you need to, you need to uh, take more, uh, be, be more actively engaged. Next. Okay, so here's, here's a, 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 a paper from a few years ago that I really like. This group conducted interviews with decision makers about research and about health research in general. Not about built environments, uh, but this is, this is what they found. Researchers did, they, the policy makers said researchers didn't understand policy making and especially the time constraints. So they need the, the evidence when they're considering a policy, not two years after they've made the policy. So we need to understand the, the timing and how uh, political pressure outweighs evidence. So we need to probably get some, some partners and you know, make a bigger push. They prefer stories and case studies more than rigorous studies. Well, that's the opposite. Stories and case studies are the bottom of the barrel evidence, right? So, uh, but, but policymakers can understand those. They cannot understand our regression results, all right? And they don't want to look at our tables. So, so of course, what's the answer? To do both. It's both. We have to publish the rigorous studies uh, to have the credibility, but we need to communicate them differently uh, to the policy makers. Uh, that's hard for us. They also valued evaluations of real world interventions. They said, well, show me something that's, that's making a difference, or evaluate what's happening in another city, and, uh, or evaluate what we're doing here, okay? So, Jeanette, you're doing some of that. So, um, that's, they, they want real world evidence. Uh, and this uh, rings true uh, for every decision maker I've ever, ever talked to. What is the most important evidence you can have? It's always about money. It's always about money. They want to know cost and cost effectiveness. And um, so decision makers would like research that's designed to be relevant to them, all right? Not a what's most rigorous or what's uh, uh, gonna be published in the, the highest impact journal. They want stuff that they can use. Okay, next. Um, okay, so this is uh, a model that I put together that is online now in translational behavioral medicine, but not quite published. And so the idea is we, we usually think about, um, uh, you know, translating evidence to policy. And that is good, but it's not the only way to get research used. We can, we can get it out to practitioners and have, have our evidence-based strategies reflected in practice guidelines. And this is very common in transportation fields, for example. Um, for business, uh, uh, with uh, a lot of health IT, um, investigators are seeing the value in uh, partnering with business or starting a business um, to get uh, uh, evidence-based strategies out there. Or you may just want to 
um, communicate your strategies uh, directly to consumers. Um, um, one of the, one of the uh, other strategies is to get the evidence to, um, you know, to the public to try to change public opinion or knowledge about, hey, maybe density is not the worst thing in the world if it helps your community be more walkable and activity friendly. And public opinion is a big influence on, on policy, especially with elected officials. So, uh, so I, uh, you know, my goal here is to help people um, maybe see different ways that their research um, could get to uh, decision makers. So let's do the next one and the next one. Uh, okay, now, this is, this is uh, uh, the next to last thing I want to do. Um, because I'd like you to take steps towards research translation. To communicate your research through a lay summary, a press release, an op-ed, letter to the editor, or social media. Um, join a local or national advocacy group and share your research. Because those advocacy groups, that's their job to, uh, to impact decision makers. So equip them with your research and they are what, uh, what we call a knowledge broker. Uh, or you can develop relationships with your own uh, decision maker. Um, and uh, of course, uh, science, it, certainly at the federal level in general, is under attack. So we need to, uh, um, uh, to support NIH and science in general. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, just a little bit about research, uh, a little bit more about research translation. This, I showed you our article that was in the Lancet. Um, uh, we also developed a, uh, a more uh, user-friendly, one-page, one-sheet uh, research brief. Next. And uh, uh, some of you probably know our Active Living Research uh, uh, website, where we've developed uh, summaries, we've developed uh, um, infographics to uh, uh, communicate more simply. Okay, and finally, just a little bit about how things have changed with, um, with built environments. When we published our first paper uh, on, on walkability in the health literature, um, uh, the editors made us put a uh, glossary in because they didn't, they said, we don't know what you're talking about. So now we have a Surgeon General's call to action on walking and walkable communities. So we've kind of made it into the mainstream. Next, um, their community guide, recommendations about built environment, a, a new one. Next, um, um, this is kind of a, a fun way of looking at impact on the transportation uh, industry. This is called the Metropolitan Cardiac uh, Authority. Um, so they're understanding that their work affects health. Next one. Um, this, is, this is wonderful. Uh, in the real estate industry, the Urban Land Institute is mainly uh, an organization of real estate developers and uh, funders. And they have a Building Healthy Places initiative. So they want to leave behind a, a legacy of healthier places and not uh, uh, a legacy of ill health. Next one, AARP, the biggest um, uh, membership organization in the country, has a livable communities initiative and walkable communities is the core of that. Next, uh, what can I do, uh, uh, you know, uh, be an advocate in your local, in your local area. Uh, I, I uh, was just giving a similar presentation in Denver. I'm sure you have organizations, uh, pedestrian and bike organizations, um, and maybe your city council uh, representative is not so uh, attuned to uh, a healthy community, so you can maybe push them over the line. So I think <coughs> one more and that's it. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention.
Let's see what other Currently comments doing are. Move with the mayor campaign. Um, move with the mayor. With the mayor, and uh, she's challenging other mayors to get her votes uh, to log their steps in different mayors across the, uh, the country. I don't know who have joined, what mayors have joined. Okay. But I know New Orleans is on board, and we had a real health advocate, community advocate uh, mayor who, who, who gets. That's the message. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. And they, uh, hopefully she'll be a, a, a really effective leader nationwide. So. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Fabulous. That's good. So hopefully that'll translate, not, not just counting steps, but making, uh, make it safer to cross streets right. uh, and, and, and have more, more destinations in these far-flung uh, neighborhoods. What other what other comments questions? There's a final exam starting at one here, so okay. Maybe we can so Emma will be will be leaving very quickly. Okay, last minute cramming with your phone. <laughs> so I whatever your whatever your research topic, um, in my view. Uh, um, the, the research translation imperative applies. We've got to stop hiding our research. We've got to be smarter about getting it used because otherwise it has no public health impact. Yes, Jim. Yeah, and another thing, when we talk about it and try to get other people outside the public health or people who are like-minded, is to, like what we were talking about the other day, not talk about health. Yes, yes. Talk about their issues. Right. Yeah, how can we help you reduce traffic? How can we help you have safer, safer streets? Yeah, and that's, that's tough, because what we're always doing is thinking health. It's better yeah. for health, and who wouldn't want to improve their health? And exactly. Do that for your health. Exactly. That message just doesn't Can't code switch. Can't, this is a little bit off topic, but I was telling Jim about your latest funding with my wife, and he was very interested, so you might want to tell us a little bit about it. Good, well, uh, please tell me more. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we let people uh, go to their next thing, and uh, thank, thank you, you so for coming. Thank you.